Great. So I, I would like to start by asking you about your field of expertise or your experiences, because I think that's very important for this. Can you tell us a little bit about your background? Um, so by training, I'm a clinical psychologist. And uh, one of the issues in a child guidance clinic that we faced in India, where I worked, um, is a huge sort of inflow of students referred mainly by schools who are underachieving. And early on, it looked like they might have dyslexia because they had a dyslexia-like profile. But very quickly, it was clear that um, what we are looking at is a system that's failing a generation of kids. And they are all underachieving, but they are underachieving not because of anything other than poor instruction or poor understanding of how you would learn a language that's not your home language. So that's how I came into the field of literacy and learning and research about context. And uh, from there I started doing a lot of surveys initially and then went into some kinds of experimental manipulations to understand and have better insight about how the orthographies of India work. And the last thing that sort of kept me busy is I've been looking at uh, a review of the kind of work that's come out of low and middle income countries. Um, this is mainly because I think there is high quality work in these countries, but it's very dispersed and there's a need to synthesize it so that we can start reviewing where the mainstream uh, models about literacy learning and mainstream models about um, instruction need to be revisited because it's not actually addressing uh, all the variety of contexts that children grow up in. So that in a nutshell is what I've been up to. Great. Um, and then can you tell us something about some of these contexts? Um, so in India my work uh, has always been with low-income communities and often marginalized communities. So children coming to learn to read in these contexts often face two or three sort of critical issues that could disrupt learning. One is that the school language is different from the home language and the school is not equipped to create any bridge between the assets of the home language and the expectations in the school language. So that's been a sort of common theme across the communities I've worked with. The second is um, a teacher community that is often at odds with the parent community. Uh, very little understanding about the aspirations of the parents, their motivations for what they do. Often a sense of uh, superiority about them knowing more than the parent community. So what that has tended to do is to create tensions between the parent community and the teacher community, or it has tended to create a situation where parents will blindly follow what the teachers ask for, and the teachers themselves might be poor models of any good literacy practices. So they might be doing things which are uh, not quite effective, but parents believe that they have the status and they give you the expert role, so they would imitate. Mm -hmm. And a recent review that we've done, uh, it's a 26-year review of uh, the work that's happening in the low-income and middle-income countries. This seems to be playing out in community after community across countries, mm -hmm. this tension between the parent and the teacher community. But what comes through in our review is that it's the rare parent who is not motivated for their child to learn, to read, and go into school and move up in terms of mobility in the social ladder. It's basically that the parent needs guidance and the school is not equipped to give the guidance. So this is the second issue. And the third issue that we've come across uh, in all the low-income uh, contexts I've worked in is uh, that the pace of the curriculum makes assumptions. Uh, for example, it makes assumptions that there's going to be a lot of uh, home tutoring. 
There's going to be a lot of support in terms of books so that you can practice, but none of this is available to many children. Mm -hmm. So you don't factor in that there are going to be different paces of learning. And it's not because of a within-child issue. It's not that the children are less capable, but the opportunities are less to actually consolidate skills. Yeah, yeah. So what advice would you offer to teachers, because we're hoping that some teachers will be watching this, yeah. um, to communicate better with parents or to help out in those situations? Obviously, I mean, it's not a one-shoe-fits-all kind of, yes. so some of the things I might say don't uh, apply to some contexts, mm -hmm. but uh, it's clear that schools need to evolve a sensitive uh, homeschool relations kind of a policy, uh, often this deteriorates into just making sure there's a parent-teacher meeting mm. and that's really just a tick box exercise unless you know what you're going to do in the meeting and why you're doing it and how are you pushing the agenda of the school into families because there's clear sociological evidence that we are turning school uh, homes into extension of schools. So there's a curricularization of childhood in these kind of contexts. I mean, high-income countries are struggling with that as well. Singapore, for example, um, Hong Kong, for example. I mean, there are these issues of all the children do at home is finish school work and do more of the same. So there is that kind of issue that's going on. So one thing for schools to realize is that they have huge impact and they restructure families and family life and needs to review that and they need to do things around that. Then the second I think is for schools to realize that home languages are being lost. The majority language that schools offer are at a price that schools, uh, schools then want the home language to be kept aside so that children do well in the school language. But there's good reason to believe that you can remain multilingual mm -hmm. and you can nurture all the languages and schools need to really review their language policy as a result of that. I mean, these two points, I think, are sort of top points to keep in mind. Okay, yeah. um, can you say something about um, what it takes for children to learn to read in India? I know mm. this is incredibly broad, <laughs> but uh, a few things that come to mind. So... Um, in India, we have a three-language policy, so children would learn at some point, at least in their primary school career, uh, they would definitely be learning two, but by the end, by grade four, they might start a third language. Uh, typically, you're expecting one of those to be the home language, but it might not be the case. It would be that all three languages are not your home language. I mean, that's how I grew up. I, I didn't have any of my school languages uh, as my home language. My home language was different, but this is not unusual. Um, but I'd like to focus on the schools that offer Indian language instruction, because in India you could have English language instruction and then Indian language instruction. So in schools that offer Indian language instruction, um, the traditional method of teaching has couple of characteristics that could be problematic but could also have a reason for having come into practice. So one is a lot of recitation, a lot of sort of reciting together, a lot of sort of working along with the teacher, turn sing song, there is a lot of um, movement through first the akshara system which is the symbols of this language, then through whole sentences, whole passages, but everybody's sort of reciting it together. Now, the, the, perhaps the tradition came because there's a huge oracy tradition in this country. So there seems to have been a reason for it. Perhaps the oracy tradition had very good uh, roots in phonological practices. So you actually learned to use the traditional way of reciting to become aware of the long vowel and the short vowel and the aspirates, so all the different consonants. Now, none of that is in practice now. All that's in practice is a parrot-like recitation. Mm -hmm. So that's something that's sort of a loss of a traditional method. 
The second uh, aspect of teaching in Indian schools often is copywriting, which means you see a target form and you have to write it. It starts with uh, the symbol set, so you're doing a lot of writing of just the symbols, but very soon you're also writing entire paragraphs, you're just copying it down. And this is again a, a loss of a tradition that might have started for, for a reason, but it's now lost. And the third, I think a, a huge positive in many Indian classrooms is that teachers actively promote that you just ask your friend if you don't understand. Mm -hmm. So peer-to-peer -peer tutoring is not frowned upon. Mm -hmm. And that's, I think, cooperative learning and that's supported in the kind of collectivist classrooms that's there. Uh, so for, for teachers who've had that kind of childhood uh, of that learning experience, when they come into their own teaching practice, often might go back to these practices. So in-service training and pre-service training has not addressed these head-on, uh, but things are changing. Yeah. And what do you observe are the uh, most common difficulties for struggling readers? <clears throat> so, so I'd like to see it as a profile of difficulties and strengths, yes. and um, it looks like different um, poor readers have different profiles, but broadly it could be in the area of oral language itself, so they are all struggling with either their vocabulary knowledge or their grasp of uh, the, just the grammar of the language. And uh, I think it's a misnomer to say that if it's your home language and you're studying in your home language, you would have it all ready and running for learning to read. Uh, but often the home language is a dialect and you need to come across into the standard language of the written form. So we can see that these are two areas that can, a poor reader could be struggling, struggling with. At the level of the script itself, uh, we have found that script knowledge is a huge predictor of struggling reading. So if they've not got their script knowledge in place, if they've not learned the Akshara system, they're going to struggle. And the, I think the biggest challenge, if you've sorted all of this out, is that reading comprehension is often at an all-time low. Mm -hmm. So there's very little engagement of with the text beyond what is stated. And inference making is not motored because of the way instruction is structured. So by middle school, we are seeing a huge plateauing off of what you can take from the text. So reading to learn is a struggle and then learning to go beyond just the text presented to you to multiple sources is another struggle mm -hmm. because these are all not uh, addressed in any systematic way, in any sort of skills oriented way. Mm -hmm. So then those who are good just pull ahead and those who are struggling and who are just at risk, they are just at the borderline, these all start falling behind. So then you get this huge variance and in, in across low income countries, but in India as well, you, school effects are some of the biggest effects that will explain literacy outcomes. Because some schools do these instructions, right? And they pull the whole cohort up and other schools don't, and then it's just the within-child factors that are moving things up. Nice. Yeah. Can you talk a little bit about, say, some differences you've seen across classrooms, maybe across countries, or some of the, a little bit about variability in the learning contexts or environments? Um, so I'll, I'll, I'll go back to some of my research in India. Yeah. So. We, we collected data from what you would call the traditional classroom and sort of the alternate classroom. Mm -hmm. So the alternate classroom uh, tended to go for much more oral language foundations, uh, more of story reading, dialogic reading, um, and somehow a lower focus on uh, practicing to write the akshara or 
anything to do with decoding too early on. So a little bit of sight word reading. So this was the alternate school. And then you had the traditional school that was quite peremptory about oral language input. So it was very much sort of functional, not too much of dialogue, very pedantic and sort of focused on the instruction and no more but very good with practicing the code. So very good with actually doing a lot of practicing about the script. And then when you look at the profiles of children as they go through these schools, uh, uh, each of these schools, what you find is that the, the, the strengths, the profile of strengths differ in the two schools. So whereas the one that's the alternate school have children with much higher vocabulary scores, much higher scores, in terms of inference making. Whereas this, the children in the traditional school have much higher scores in the decoding. And then by the time you're coming into grade three and four and five, what you then find is that the predictors are different. In one, the predictor becomes, the one that was focusing on decoding, the predictor becomes vocabulary. And the one where the focus was on vocabulary, the predictor becomes the decoding skills. So the, the instruction starts changing what happens in, within the school. So the, the predictors within the school changes in a sense. I think classrooms do tend to sort of uh, support some profiles more than others or some parts of the profile more than others. Mm -hmm. And uh, clearly a, a balanced approach of the two is needed for everyone to gain from it. Is there any advice you would offer to teachers about how to teach early literacy? Kind of from a global perspective, this is a very broad question. Yeah, yeah. Well, our review, uh, the one I was talking about, the 26 year review, we were looking at what do we know from um, different communities about what works. And one thing that comes through is if you focus on oral language skills, you are setting up firm foundations. So do not ignore it. Make sure that children are comfortable in the language of the school and actually expressing in the language of school, not just being able to write it. So that's one thing that's come from our review. The second thing that's come from our review is if it's a low income context, you need to have a broad based intervention. So you can teach well in school, but bring in the family to do things more than for the school and, and um, ensure that there's, I mean, we have very clear neighborhood effects. So uh, we have very clear measures, for example, the class average of mother's education is a predictor of individual differences in the class. So obviously there are communities where mothers are helping each other and if they're higher uh, sort of educated mothers, it would make a difference to the entire community. So if teachers could band families together and not deal with them as units. And I mean, community work would also include things like ensure there are libraries that allow books to go home, ensure there are, you know, community reading practices that you can support. Mm -hmm. So I would say teachers need to think beyond the lesson and they need to think about where does that lesson get practiced and what's the purpose of it. Yeah. Great. Um, last question. Just is there anything you'd like to say about the extent to which there are elements of reading and writing in India or other lower income countries you study that are not covered by the standard models that are published out there? That, there's a lot to say. <laughs> <I think. laughs> um, I think the reading models need to become much more multifactorial. I think it's become more multifactorial in the last decade. Uh, but the models um, somehow remain... In some models, there's an implication of context and the value that is brought by world knowledge and opportunities uh, about topic knowledge and things like that. But none of our models actually address what goes into that. So, so if you're looking at a reading comprehension model we, and we're looking at you know, the situation model, or we're looking at context building. From where do those sort of nuggets of ideas come? It comes from experience, it comes from um, talking to people. So we need a much more sophisticated 
contextual model that will support the within child kind of frameworks we have. But within child, I think one area that completely doesn't uh, feature is the role of uh, visual motor skills and that seems to be a big area that definitely must be making an impact at the foundation stage. Uh, but I know that the body of evidence for that has to come up but as the body of evidence is growing we need to see how does it all integrate because clearly the learning mechanisms are multimodal and we don't seem to have a multimodal uh, model beyond the visual and the auditory but we need to go beyond that so I, I that, that's two but there are more but yeah these are the two that I would say okay that's great um, anything else you want to add Andrew? yeah I think researchers need to become much more sensitive about the context I think we can do great research we have really made a lot of progress in terms of methodology so there's much more rigorous methodology I I can see that we are doing much better in terms of um, research for practice, mm -hmm. so we have better efficacy trials, all of that. But I think we are really lagging behind in terms of cultural sensitivity in our intervention building. And we don't seem to have a language as yet about what do we mean by cultural sensitivity. We st seem to think translating something is cultural sensitivity. It is not. Uh, we seem to think that we, if we have a couple of consultations with local teachers, we've done it. We haven't. So there needs to be, I think, much better. I think there needs to be a maturing of the research community in terms of cultural sensitivity.